Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. In today's episode, I speak with Jakob Fahl, Executive Vice President and Chief Operations Officer of IAPA, International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. We discuss just why the attractions industry is so exciting, the ongoing labour shortages, sustainability and where the attractions industry is headed in terms of technology. If you like what you hear, subscribe on all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Jakob, thank you so, so much for joining me today. You're a very, very busy man, so I'm very grateful that you could come on and spare us some time. It's a pleasure to have to, to be with you today, Kelly. So thanks for the invite. I'm, I'm honoured. Oh, well, it's, oh, the honour is all mine, trust me. But uh, you might not be so honoured once we finish with our icebreaker questions, although I feel like I've been quite, quite kind to game today. All right, okay. I want to know... What is the best theme park ride that you have ever been on? Wow, that's that's a difficult. I, I think it's as difficult as you know, say a favorite car because <laughs> there, there is a there's a specific mood for everything, you know. And if I, it also depends on the company, you know. If I go with my with my buddies, you know, probably I would have said Boulder Dash at Lake Compounds, which is a intense wooden coaster. If I go. With my kids, I take you know any any kind of Disney ride or, or, or whatever. And if I go with my wife, it's probably no ride at all. But it's a it's a great restaurant in a, in, in a park. So it's actually very very hard to judge. But I have to say, um, obviously the, the 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 big things in the industry always blew me away. And that was Indiana Jones at Disneyland at Disneyland Anaheim. It was you know um, Spider Man at Islands of Adventure. It was the first Harry Potter rides. You know, it was really kind of those where I would consider revolutionary developments in in the dark ride industry where you just walk out and say wow wh- what was that and star wars was the most recent one yeah oh, that was a great answer i think that was that was a brilliant answer i love that you gave different answers for the different people that you were with as well i think that was you know what it great. is I, I i think you know it's the same thing about favorite parks i have you know i i love the atmosphere in a scandinavian park at night you know when it comes alive with the lights with concerts but if if I would go just for rides, you know, it would be probably the Universal Parks. If I go with my family, it's something else. It it it, it really depends on 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 the mood of the day. Brilliant, perfect answer. Could not have been better. Right. If you had to listen to one album on repeat continuously, what would that album be? Wow, uh, it would be a classic album, I think. And um, because uh, as much as I love all kinds of music, if, if I would need to listen to something continuously, I need something which doesn't stress me and which kind of relax me. And then um, it would be, I don't know the English term. It's, 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 it's a track called Moonshine Sonata. It's a, it's a sonnet of the, of the moonlight or Tchaikovsky, which I like a lot as well. well that sounds lovely. Uh, I actually do this in the car. So I've started yeah. to listen to Classic FM, which is a, a radio station in the UK. Um, because it's really calming. Yes. And and if you're just, it's just really relaxing and really calm and it just puts you in a really kind of zen mood. Yeah. I'm sure that's all right for driving to be zen. Yeah, that's fine. Especially in a traffic jam if you have aggressive drivers around you, you know, that, that exactly. is actually. <laughs> just wind the window down. Take in, yeah. my, take in my classic <laughs> FM. Okay. What would be, what would be your favorite tradition? Something that you do every year or something that you do do every month it's probably a ski weekend with my with my best friends I'm, I'm moving to Orlando so that's actually the hard part because I'm 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 I love skiing and I probably spend most of my money on skiing because it, it this means I think it comes back to what you say in music there's nothing else where I can more relax and unwind because you're just you know in the nature you 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 you're doing sports well it's it's not really challenging as a sport but it's it's just wonderful to be out there and I think that's that's something I really really love to go with my with my best friend just for a weekend and we ski and ski. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? That's going to be a big change for you then, moving oh, yes. to Orlando. Yes, you know I live right now in the Black Forest, and we have the four seasons here in in Orlando. I think it's the four seasons of humidity, <laughs> but um, you know I, there, there are other great things about Orlando. So you know. I, I will definitely miss the snow, but there will be plenty of other things I'm very excited about. Absolutely. Well, yes. I mean, for an attraction specialist, could there be a better place to be than Orlando? Maybe not. Right. Jakob, what's your unpopular opinion? 
I don't like special days in theme parks. Um, and this comes from a from a from a from a longer from a longer history. You know, we have we have seen in theme parks uh, days for for special needs or, or days, you know, or so-called gay days. And and I think I would like us to be so inclusive that we don't need special days to to accommodate those people. It should be a normal thing. It should be just you know. I, I don't also like when you go to toilets and there's a special sign for disabled people. It should be that they are always accessible. And I think it should be a regular part of our business that you don't need to market designated days for, for designated groups because we should be so inclusive that, you know, it's, it's every day. That's a really good opinion. And I'm pretty sure that a, a lot of people would agree with you on that one as well. So maybe it's not going to be quite as unpopular as you think. Then I have another unpopular opinion. Oh, we'll know. throw that at us. If you're going to well, let's, let's have another one. <laughs> I'm tired of the word immersive. I don't think every attraction needs to be immersive. I think it's totally fine that you have a great thrill ride, that you have a great roller coaster. It doesn't always need to have a storyline, or own soundtrack or like a, like a big theme. It's also fine sometimes to just have a great ride in itself and to let it stand for itself without, you know, any IP without a branding, without a soundtrack, without all of that stuff. Mm, all right. Well, listeners, I would love to know your thoughts on these. Um, tweet me. Let me know what you think. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Jacob. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and where you are now? I'm sitting right now in Germany, where I'm originally from. I uh, work for IAPA, which I have done now for uh, uh, four and a half years. It's my second time with IAPA. Beforehand, I worked for Europa Park. So this is why I still kind of live in that area, because I was lucky enough to meet my wonderful wife here in this region. So I stayed here even when moving away from Europa Park. Um, but I have been what you would consider a uh, and in this industry aficionado, you can call me nerd, enthusiast, geek, whatever you want. But um, I think as many people, I, I started in the industry as a, as a teenager. My first job was when I was 16. I checked tickets at Fantasialand at the, at the entrance, the Mexican side entrance to Fantasialand. And uh, I fell in love with this industry and I, I never left for the, for the disbelief of my parents who still hope one day I have a serious job. But, um, you know, I... I <laughs> <laughs> I think I even got them so far that they understand what, what this is about and what it means for me and that we are a, a huge industry. But, you know, since then, I think um, I, I, I love this industry and I'm sometimes, you know, like the, like the child in the candy store because um, I think we, we have the privilege of, of actually our only purpose is bringing joy to the people. And uh, there are not many industries out there which can say that for themselves. And, and in that way, you know, so you see lots of discussion about human resources, about, you know, bringing young talent to the industry. And I think we need to highlight that more because um, you, you see that it's those companies which have a purpose, which have a mission, which are very popular among young people. You know, Patagonia, you know, Oatly, uh, Veja, those sneaker brands, you know, it's those which say that they're doing good for the people. And ultimately, yes, we are, as an industry, as our members, we are commercially driven, but hey, we bring fun to the people. And I think that is, unfortunately today, more needed than ever before. Oh, I could not agree with you more. Bringing fun to the people. I mean, there could not be a, a better definition of, of what the sector is all about. I absolutely love that. What's really interesting is, most people that come on here that are attractions aficionados, as you called yourself, they do start very young in the yes. sector. So it is it is an industry that that it really it does retain people. Right. You know, people fall in love with it at a really early age, which is really lovely to see. And I want to ask you a little bit about this later on in the podcast, actually, something that you talked about in terms of uh, recruitment and, and getting more younger people into the industry. Well, Kelly, we, 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 we always said two things. You know, we said once you work for the industry, you will never work for anything else for two reasons, because you don't want to work for anything else. And actually, the second one is no one will take you seriously once you have work with us. <laughs> That's it. You're done in. So you have to stay. <laughs> yes, you have to stay. Oh, I love that. Okay. Well, let, what, 
you're now at IAPA and you've just yes. taken on um, an ex- incredibly senior role there. Can you tell us a little bit about that and then and what that role involves? Yes, I, my, my first time at IAPA was from uh, 2009 to 2014. And I worked with Karen Staley, who was back then the, the vice president. Today, she's with Sally Darkrides. And, um, you know, I, I, I fell in love with this association because I think, you know, again, we, we fulfill a role in trying to promote the industry and in bringing people together. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. I left then for Yopa Park, where I had, you know, four amazing years with, with the Mack family, with Michael Mack, where I learned a lot. And then this job opened up at, at IAPA EMEA um, as a vice president. And, and, you know, I always had two hearts in my chest. I was very passionate about the association. And then I took that chance and I have had, you know, four four and a half fantastic years with IAPA EMEA. And then um, I was lucky enough to, to have a great CEO with Helen McElvoy and uh, we discussed. And at one moment, you know, he, he changed the strategy and saying that he wanted to be you know, also more in, in, in presenting IAPA on a, on a bigger picture and, you know, asked me to, to take over the, the role as CEO and, um, this is, this is a great opportunity. I'm very happy about what we have achieved in, in the EMEA region. And I look forward to, to work with the regional leaders, which we have, you know, with, with June Co. in the APEC region, with Michael Shelton in North America, and with Paulina Reyes in Latin America, and my successor now, Peter van der Schans, to try to um, bring that industry further and to, 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 you know, to deliver more membership services and uh, be of help for our members. So what so what is your your role there now? What is your kind of purpose at, at IAPA? What do you what do you drive? So I lead the operations of IAPA across the world. So that means you know I'm in charge for the four regional offices, for the global sales, for our three expos. You know we have IAPA Expo Asia, which unfortunately we we had to cancel due to the COVID situation in in Hong Kong or in in the, in the region and in Shanghai, where the expo was supposed to take place. And the one in Europe, which takes place this year in London. Kelly, I hope to, to see you there. Yes, I will and, be there. Uh, then obviously our, our big ship, the, the one in Orlando, which always takes place in November. So I'm ultimately in charge for those big trade shows for the regions, but also for, for the many regional events across the world where we try to bring together people to, you know, to learn from each other, to inspire each other, to connect with each other. And we have the next upcoming event in, in Orlando now where we're going to see the new Icebreaker Coast at SeaWorld. We are going to have in the Mayor region an event in May in Italy where we are going to see Cinecitta World, Magic Land and, and Zoo Marine, where we really try to look into things, what's, what's hot, what should be seen, what can we tell in terms of educating our members about best practices that really everyone comes and sees something and walks away back home to say, hey, I can apply that in my business to become better. And I think that that's what drives us in in trying to come up with those events. It's been an incredibly difficult time for the attractions industry, yeah. full stop. But for you personally, that must have been very difficult because I, I guess that you are used to traveling a lot all over the world to all of these you know, be, uh, incredible places and attractions that you just described. That must have been really tough for you. Well, I think um, first we... I have a very passionate team and I think the whole IAPA team is very passionate and, and we felt for our members, you know, we struggled because we had to cancel shows as well. You know, it was, it was sad because we put a lot of work into, into things which had to be canceled. But I think we suffered mainly seeing our members struggling with changing rules, with being forced to close down with, with all of those things. And I, I try to look at the good things of, of right, the good sides of things and, I think during those past 24 months, our industry grew together. And I think, you know, when we, when the pandemic first hit, um, it was in very short notice that we got together the key leading experts, health and safety experts from all the big parks across the world who developed a paper on, on safe reopening for theme parks. And Seeing that, how we worked together as, as a unity, how we worked with national associations, how we tried to, to support each other, how we sent letters, how we talked to governments, I think that was actually where the association came alive. And yes, it was hard for us to not being able to bring people face to face together, but it was, I think, good because we saw stronger than ever before the value of an association. And, and it was 
we got many feedback from members across the world saying, listen, I went to my government with this paper and they saw that we are safe and they saw it and they let me open again. And that, that was very fulfilling, obviously, for the members, but also for us, because we saw that what we did was, was of purpose. That's incredibly powerful, isn't it? That that document had yeah. such a, a huge effect on attractions all over the world. But that is, again, you know, a, a privilege of this industry, I think. You know, in, in a way, yes, parks, our members, our, our, our facility members, our supplier members are in a certain way competing. You know, they're competing about the same money, about the same time. But I think if, if we have certain discussion items of, of whatever nature, and I call the, the different members, they all group around the table, they all share their, their learnings, their best practices, and they walk away and everyone is kind of doing their thing again. But I'm not sure if this is the same thing in many other businesses, in the car industry, in the computer industry, in the mobile industry. I don't think people are that open with each other. And I think this is where it's special to work for this association because you feel that one member thinks, you know, listen, if, if a client, if a guest has a good time in a different park, it's helpful for me as well. But if they have a bad experience somewhere, they are probably less likely to visit other amusement parks. And I think this is, this is what makes our industry special because I think we have understood that. That's really interesting. And that, that is something, again, that's come up time and time again when we've spoken to people in the sector is just one is, one is how collaborative it is and yeah. supportive of each other. Um, but two, I mean, do, do you think that that, do you think it's more so since the pandemic? It, I, it was bef- it was prior to, but do you think that that's accelerated because of the pandemic situation? It, it was always there. I think it was always there. Um, I, I think we always have had those dedicated members which have contributed massively through committees, through white papers for our members on, you know, on best practices, on on right commissioning, for example, or on right evacuation, you know, those really kind of guidelines where we get safety experts together, creating a document for those parks which might not have the same resources and trying to, you know, to, to level that up. I think what we have seen through the pandemic is that we got those members who might have been inactive before to get them closer, you know, to get them closer to the association, closer to other members. And I think that that has been a benefit. I think we have never talked to so many members throughout the pandemic and sometimes listening and sometimes, you know, giving advice and sometimes, you know, we only let them vent, but it was good to realize that none of us was alone in that time. And we, we did some live chats where, you know, we had 50 or 60 water park operators and everyone shared their story. And maybe, you know, there were some learnings, maybe they were, you know, but I think it was, more important for them to actually see, hey, I'm not alone in this, you know, and others others go through this as well. And and to create that community feeling while we could not have this face-to-face experience at the events. Yeah, one, uh, wonderful. It's it's it is phenomenal that you've been able to facilitate that level of support for your members. Let's talk about let's talk about what's coming next though, because I guess one of the positives from going through that process is, is that you did get to speak to so many members. Like you said, some of them had, you know, there was things that you could share to support them. Some people just wanted to rant. But I guess all of that knowledge helps you understand what more you can do for your members and then develop new kind of support support programs for them for the future. So what what have you got in development? What can you share with us about what's coming next for IAPA? I think the pandemic has probably been an accelerator to things in the same way it has been to members as it has for us, you know, and, and we see that with, with operators across the world that, that the, those past two years have been a huge accelerator for everything digital. And I think that is something which, which we see for ourselves as well. If I, you know, remember trade shows three years ago, we always had the sign at the exit, you know, see you next year. And I think this is, this is 2019. Today it is see you tomorrow on a digital space. Because mm. you need to create those those connections all year round. Because people have learned to to live digitally, and and don't want to wait to to be face to face to be able to do that. And I think that is something where we, for ourselves, and also with our board of directors, have decided. You know, listen, we want to invest more into into digital options. We have already have great great digital learning availabilities and 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 those offerings. But I think it's really kind of the networking, the connecting part where we 
where we want to become stronger in, in the years to come. Absolutely, because you know, with digital, we can facilitate conversations like this. You know, we're on yeah. different, we're in different parts of the world, and we're just having a lovely chat on our podcast. But you can bring together people from all over the place in one central location. I mean, that, it's, it's it's so incredibly powerful to be able to do that, and it it seems crazy that we've only been doing that for the last couple of years because of the pandemic, right? It, it wasn't it wasn't mainstream prior no. to that you know no. it is it is crazy well that's brilliant so we're going to be seeing more digital engagement for IAPA bringing people together more frequently which is absolutely what people I'm sure want and I also think what we what we're going to see and what we're already doing is to try to to be more regional I think you know we, we have seen that with the trade shows last year those in in Barcelona and Orlando <clears throat> that they were good trade shows they were smaller than they used to be and they were more regional because of travel restrictions and because of everything and i think you know we 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 have seen that that there's a need for a regional presence and and th- th- those success stories of the regional offices of iapa come come from that because we have people on the ground they speak the language they understand the market they they know the players and this is where we want to offer more smaller opportunities of bringing people together face to face you know obviously digital we do that but also face to face because as great as this all is in in connecting it's still a difference also i think for the two of us kelly you know if we sit now in front of a screen how much nicer it would be if we sit somewhere you know next to each other and talk about absolutely absolutely and 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 this will never replace it i think it it complements each other and this is where we try to to be closer to actually our members to go towards them to see what they're doing and to to highlight what they're doing, what innovations they are. There's so many wonderful innovations, facilities, stories to tell out there. And, you know, ideally, I I, I would like to do something every week. We don't have the resources for that, but, um, you know, we, 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 we want to be closer to our members. Brilliant. It's interesting you say about that, that, you know, the kind of face to face and in person, because nothing will ever replace that whatsoever. But I I had this. Especially not in our industry, I think, you know, because we are very social industry. Absolutely. And you've got fantastic venues and spaces to do those to to do that in as well. So why not? Um, But I had this conversation with somebody last week about how it's just kind of cut down a lot of the the longevity and and travel that was associated with kind of little mini micro meetings you know you want to meet someone for a coffee and kind of see if you get to know them first right this is a great way of doing that without spending two hours on a train to get wherever they are so this is just I see this is the first step and then the the second this is the first date the second date is the coffee in real life (laughs) yes exactly and I want to go back to something that you talked about right at the beginning of the interview where um you said about you, you you worked in the sector from a young age and you it, it, they're, they're good at retaining um, people because yeah. they fall in love with the sector. So in the UK, there's a there's a huge labour shortage in the UK currently. Um, and it is a huge challenge to the sector, especially in the kind of hospitality roles yeah. that attractions have. Is this something that's widespread across Europe and the US? Um, yeah. So you, you're still you're having those problems as well. What, Unfortunately, yes. What do you see as a, as, a, as a solution to that? And have you seen any kind of interesting examples of attractions that are doing things really well to, to, to hire new staff and retain the ones that they have? I, I think what you said, unfortunately, it's, it's a global problem. And I don't know where everyone went, but for <laughs> sure, you know, we, 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 we all lack and we all lack of, of, of workforce. And I think that's, that's a huge problem. And the pandemic has not helped that because, you know, we, I think we have seen many people who, who received furlough money and they were all okay, but people want to work, you know, and if you have that chef who sits at home and can't work, he might not come back to a theme park because we were so affected by that. And I think this is something first where we need to create the circumstances that we can, that we can operate and that we can actually, you know, employ our people that we stay open. What I see are several are several trends. I think one of the things is that many parks try to extend their season to walk away more from, from seasonal workforce to all year round, you know, so that creates a, a better attractive place. I think then what we have also seen is that, how to say, sometimes our, our jobs lacked a little bit of content in the, in the external view. I think, you know, people had... Had, had not the highest regards of our industry. And I think this is where we need to 
where we need to kind of, you know, diversify our offering a little bit more and actually tell people what a great, what a great job they can have with our industry. And I, I, I'm very impressed by initiatives which you see popping up all across members to, to highlight what a, great, what a great place this is to be. I'll give you two examples. Europa Park in Germany, um, uh, Miriam Mack, one of the family members of the Mack family, she introduced a health program for, for her staff. So, you know, they, they have very good health benefits. They have, you know, they, they all have those values which are of relevance for young people today where they care about. I think it's less about the money, but it is about what can a company offer to me in, in, in the overall package. We will not win the race for money. You know, you can, I think, probably increase the salary, but I don't think that the young generation is about money. It's about what we discussed before, purpose. It's about, you know, what does the company deliver? And then we have a third example or a second example from, from the US, Hershant um, Entertainment Corporation with beautiful parks like Silver Dollar City, Dollywood. They actually introduced free education for all the 11,000 employees. Completely wow. Free. wow. And, and this is where you see they, they kind of try to work on the benefits, not only on the money side, but really try to make people young people understand hey this is a great place to work we educate you we 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 promote you we give you options and and it is the same way why i'm sitting here i started at 16 and i checked tickets and now i'm sitting here where i am today and there are hundreds of those stories and and i think that is something where we need to to highlight that hey you know you might start only putting down seat belts or checking you know or or, or selling burgers but there's a great career path ahead of you. And we as IAPA, sorry for taking that so long, but you, you feel it's close to our hearts. We as IAPA work, work, try to work closely with universities across, across the world, which specialize in attraction management program. We uh, just like three days ago, we, we had the first intern in our office from, from Buas in, in Breda, which is a university specialized, specialized in, in attractions um, classes. And, and, it's those people kind of when they come in huge groups to the trade show, you know, they usually come with 40 students. You see the passion for that industry. And, and this is just one example of many where we are very grateful for working with those universities to try to highlight how attractive we are actually as, a, as an industry. Absolutely brilliant examples then. That was I mean, that's phenomenal. That'll be really, really useful to our listeners, I'm sure. And, and, it, and it goes back to what we were saying. It is about value driven, purpose driven, yeah. explaining what it is that, that is the benefit of working there, not just this is how much it is and this is the role that you'll do. This is where you can go. This is where you can progress and, and really showcasing the kind of culture of the attraction as well. And now I know sustainability is is something that you like to talk about quite a lot. I've, I've seen some of your posts on LinkedIn. So it is a real big hot topic now, as it, as it should be. Um, how can attractions start to put sustainability at the heart of what they're doing? And, and have you seen any great examples of that that you could share with us as well? Yes, I, I'm, I'm actually the staff liaison for the sustainability committee. You know, I have uh, two years ago probably introduced a sustainability committee under the leadership of Andreas Andersen from SEO from Lieseberg. Um, and to be very frank with you, we probably have not been on the forefront of that subject as an industry. And I think, you know, we, we have to pick up a little bit, but I see a huge interest in that. And I see, you know, when we, when we started the sustainability committee in the, in the past years, we noticed all the big car park groups of this world are enthusiastic about collaborating with us. They all want to say, listen, we want to do more. What can we do more? We need to... We, we need to step up the game here. And it's, it's, it's very nice to see, to see the growing importance of that. I'm, I'm not a firm believer, or it's a thin line between educating people and still let them have fun. You know, I think you, you, it, it's always difficult because you don't want to spoil the day by kind of, kind of delivering all those horrible messages. And we just had an event um, yeah, in end of February at the World Expo in Dubai. And we had a great session with the, with the head of the sustainability pavilion, which did a fantastic job about telling a story, telling about what needs to be better, but not kind of, you know, being Debbie Downer and, and depressing, depressing the guests. But I think 
what we need to understand is that sustainability is more than just the ecological aspect, you know, and we refer to the 17 goals of the United Nations, and which I think are at the, at the core of sustainability. And there are some beautiful examples in this industry. And I, and, and you know, it, it starts with small attractions. You know, one of our board members, um, Massimiliano Freddi, he has a small attraction called Wonderwood in Italy, which is not the greatest or not the biggest facility, but they only kind of produce food from the local farmers and, and they only serve that and they are very inclusive to everyone, you know, and they really stand up for their values, which is beautiful. Another wonderful example is Miniature Wonderland, that craziest place. I'm not sure. Have you have you heard of that, Kelly? No, no. It sounds up my street, though. I'm five foot two. I feel like I would fit in well there. It's absolutely <laughs> no, it's absolutely crazy. It's it's a place in Hamburg which started as a miniature railway. And it's so in love with details. I think they make more than a million guests every year. It's three brothers. And I think no business plan, no feasibility study would have ever expected this to be successful. But it was their passion and their heart which made them come this way. So what they did is that they introduced, um, I think, in two weeks in, in, in spring, um, weeks where they let in everyone for free who comes to the entrance say and who comes to the entrance gate and says, I can't afford it. And if you don't feel comfortable in saying that, you can put a paper and they let you in for free. And interestingly enough, I think it's a wonderful gesture in a, in a very social, ethical way of allowing people to experience what they normally couldn't. But they actually also said, listen, this was commercially successful for us because it, break, it brought such, a, such an attention to our place, such an awareness that it paid off. And, and I think this is, this is a wonderful example. And if, if you have time for one more example. Please, yeah, please. Karl's Strawberry Farms, also Germany. It's a, it's a place which grew out of a strawberry farm. They had so many guests that they built a cafe and then a restaurant and then attractions. They built a hotel in completely upcycled. So all the material they use is recycled. And I think this is, all those things, examples for, for wonderful, sustainable policies without, you know, hitting you like you're a bad person, you must not do that, you must not do that, but kind of showcasing, hey, we do something with the right values and we do it and it's actually still a beautiful experience for everyone. It's about weaving it into the whole experience, isn't it? Like it's a story. As it is, it's part of. It's at the heart of the attraction, yes. and rather than kind of something that you've stuck on as a plaster at the end of it. Oh, by the way, this is our sustainability policy, and this is our recycling policy, and and it it's about kind of living and breathing it. It needs to be lived. Yeah, it needs to be lived. It needs to be uh, led. I think also, and and it doesn't help to to say you know listen we we do it because we have to and you know everyone is doing. I mean, it's a classic greenwashing example. Yeah. But um, I I see in our sustainability committee, you know, we have wonderful like, members from all across the world. When you look at what what Liseberg is doing, what um, what uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium is doing, you know, what um, all those fantastic and wonderful places are are doing to to be more sustainable in what they do to to try to you know do their business model i think it's 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 very impressive and again my to, to quote my chairman andreas anderson of that committee he says you know he thinks that sustainability will be in five years as important as safety is today for our industry and and i and i wouldn't disagree with that i think it will be a basic of 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 our industry if it's in five years if it's in seven or in ten we will see but i think it's it will be a basic expectation of our guests absolutely yeah and you're absolutely right one more thing it comes back to hr as well i think that is also something young people look at you know and if 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 people today if the generation z looks for employment i think they also want to see or many of them want to see that those values of sustainability are lived within the company yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's the change in demographic or, or, or age brackets of people that will start to visit those attractions, right? Because yeah. that's what the younger generation are really interested in, sustainability, um, you know, caring for the environment. And that's what they'll be looking at places that they come to work for or, or places that they come to visit and spend their hard-earned cash. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to just go back to something that you said um, earlier about 
the shift in kind of digital um, advancements in the sector. So we've seen the kind of contactless economy grow rapidly during the pandemic. You know, the shift to digital ticketing um, and payments in the attractions industry is, is rapidly, rapidly accelerated. What what do you think is next? And what do you because you didn't you because you said that you 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 need to you need to be at the forefront of what's hot and what's coming next. So I'm testing you now. What do you think is next for the attractions industry? And where do you see these things going in the next kind of three to five years? I, I think um there, there, there are two sides to the story. I think you know there's a back end side and the front end side. I think um what we have seen is that people won't get rid of this little thing you know it's it's everywhere they they can't let it go you know they're all addicted including myself it's horrible but he's talking about let Jakob's talking about a phone just just yes. really oh, just everyone yes. who can't see it <laughs> just in yeah, case but, you were wondering what everyone knows you know if we say we're all addicted to it we all know about those you know smartphones <laughs> and dominating our day and i think this is where we need to incorporate the smartphone the mobile into into the experience of a day. And that is kind of, you know, where I say this is the, the guest excitement because while 20 years ago, they only looked at the scenery all day long. Now they look at the mobile half of the day. So the question is, how do you bring the park experience on the mobile? And 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 I think there, there are some great examples. I There's this wonderful little Danish park called Sommerland Sierland. And they have a, they have a great owner called Kare Juvika. Probably I pronounce it wrongly but he's a he's a technology aficionado the same way i'm about about amusement parks and he kind of plays with his app in a way that you can shoot water cannons you can feed the animals you know all with your smartphone and i think this is funny because it's it's an enhancement of the experience of the experience through your through the through your phone and i think that is something which you which you will see which we will see further that's yeah. um that's a really important point to make is that it's about enhancement and not detraction yeah. so yeah. we just to it just to complement that we had uh, jacob thompson on from attractions io yes. um a few a few weeks ago and this was a a question that we posed to him actually is that how do you 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 want people to engage with the app but you don't want to distract them exactly. from what's actually going around there so it has to be an enhancement it has to be things that you you use it for example he painted a really great picture of he said okay well look imagine that you are uh you're you're in one of the play areas at the park and your kids are going crazy mm -hmm. they're running all over the place they're hungry you're starting to get hungry everyone's a bit angry <laughs> because they're hungry you can just grab your phone now place your order at the, uh, uh, for your food and then five minutes later go and collect it you know you haven't got to trudge around trying to find where it is or you know wait in a, in a massive queue and it's yeah. those little things that make that experience better and they solve a problem that you have instantly but they're not detracting you from the experience at all yeah and i think that that comes actually too much to my other aspect because i think there's a there's an experience aspect in a, in a way of experiencing the the fun part but i think technology is nearly probably even more important today in terms of the customer journey. I think we have an expectation today, and I always say it's the opposite of a car rental company at an airport. You know, you go there, you have booked everything, you have put in all the data beforehand, and still you need 10 minutes or 20 minutes to give them all the data again. And that is kind of, you know, the, 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 worst, the worst example of, of, of customer flow. And if you think about this as a worst example, you need to think about how can I use technology to make it as easy as possible for my guests to come to book his ticket to have the best day ever and in the best way actually in the end to recommend it and there i think that there there are there are those those very innovative people i am um, you know coming back to what i said before skiing i recently went to a ski resort in in switzerland lax and and, and they have an app which is perfect because you know if you don't want to go if you don't want to go by car to the lift station you can order a shuttle if you go by car, you can order a parking space. You can you can buy your lift pass. You can extend your lift pass. You can buy a virtual line. You can uh, order a restaurant table for lunch. You can see through all cameras how many people are waiting at which lift. So you can plan your day. Right. You can actually in the evening you have a, a kind of the same idea of 
of Uber Eats. You can order your food all through that app. And, you know, this is just in one flow where you really kind of just make it as easy as possible for the guests to enjoy and to have the best time ever. Because I think what we have seen in the past years that time is limited. And if people, especially now after the pandemic, if they want to get out, if they want to make an excursion, if they want to do a trip to an amusement park, to a ski resort, to whatsoever, they want this to be seamless, to be perfect from A to Z. And, and the masterminds in this industry is, and I'm happy that they are an IPA member, is Tomorrowland, the music festival in, in Belgium. They are so sophisticated in what they're doing. It, it always blows me away. And, and can I, have you heard about it, how they work? No, please, please share. So, so it's a festival which takes place this year on three weekends. I think each weekend is sold out within you know, like 10 minutes, 180,000 persons each weekend. And when you book your ticket, you know, when you get one, when you're lucky, um, you get after probably like eight weeks out, it might be one, but some weeks out, you get a box home with a wristband. On that wristband, everything is safe. Your name, your access ticket, wherever you can go, you know, because there's special categories. You can upload money on that, on that wristband, you know, through credit card, online. So you don't need anything than this wristband. Two weeks prior to the, wisp, to the event, it starts actually living. You know, it breathes, it, it, it blinks. There are like little LEDs on it. And when you go there, this is your only thing which you need all, all the time. And this is where I think, you know, using technology to make things easier, but at the same time, enhancing the experience again, you know, because it, it, it is themed, it looks beautiful. Really, Kelly, you know, I, I will send you a link afterwards. You should have a look at it. Please say, yeah. It's, it's, it's so thought through, you know, you can pay and it's, it's a temporary festival. You can pay everything cashless on site, you know, and, and everything is settled. And I think it's just hilarious. It's just fantastic. And, um, you know, we looked at, at several technologies of that and you could even, if you want to, you know, you could even use it in a way that if someone comes, I would recognize who that is. So, you know, and I, we thought about it at one moment, how great this would be for Halloween. You know, when, when you walk into a, into a horror house or into a maze and I would know, you know, through your wristband, oh, Kelly is coming and I'm the scare actor and I can say, hi, <laughs> Kelly, good to see you. I mean, how great is that? And this is, I think, where digital technology has advanced so much. And um, the only problem is, it advances so quickly that I have no idea, you know, probably in four years, we will laugh about where we stand today. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? It's an unfair question. We're, we're, we're developing in so rapidly in that area. Yeah. Who knows what the next three or four years will, will yeah. hold. Um, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much for your input today, Jakob. I've really enjoyed talk, talking to you. Same here. I always ask my guests for a book at the end of the show that they would recommend to our listeners though. Now it can be something that you love from personally, or it can be something that you've read that's maybe helped shape your career in some way. Have you got anything that you'd recommend for us? I have a favorite book, but it has absolutely nothing to do with my career or whatsoever. That's I, fine. That's fine. I really, really enjoyed reading Tender Bar. Um, I, I don't even know who the author is, I'm, I'm afraid to say. But um, it's a wonderful story about the love of a, of a young boy to, to a bar. And he grows up with that bar. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful story. They actually made a movie out of it. The movie was not so great. So I, you know, don't watch the movie, read the book. And um, then what I, what I actually um, also like from a, from a personal development kind of, of thing is uh, there's a book called The, Co the, Co the Courage to be Disliked. Oh, I like and it. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's a very nice book. Um, not that it helped me, but I, I enjoyed reading it and it gave some, some great inspiration. Is it about um, like forming opinions? So, you know, be, not, not being scared to, to, to state your mind, you know? Yes. And it's also about not trying to set as an excuse where you come from. You know, you, you, you shouldn't excuse yourself for the person you are because of your history, you know, you can, you can change every day and you can decide to, to be a different person every day. And I think that is something which is, which is very, very interesting. You know, that's a great book. I'm going to, I'm going to get that book. You should. It's, it's very interesting. And if you, if you don't like it, blame it on me. And then, 
the drink is on me the next time you see each other. But uh, I, I, I honestly gonna, really, really enjoyed it. I'll take you up on that. Well, look, listeners, um, as ever, if you want to win a copy of this book, if you head over to our Twitter account and you retweet this episode announcement with the words, I want Jakob's book, then you can win it. I'm going to go and buy myself a copy and read it before you guys get it. Um, but Jakob, thank you so much for your time today. You're an incredibly busy man. So I'm very grateful that you've been able to come on and, and share with us. And um, I look forward to meeting you in person, hopefully at the IAPA conference in London. Same here, Kelly. It was a, it was a huge pleasure to, to talk to you. And if, if I can, and I don't want to do a commercial thing here, but, you know, I mean, I was just trying to explain what IAPA does, but we we want to be there for our members and also for those who are not members. So, you know, whenever you thought I said something great or you thought I said something horrible, reach out to me, you know, disagree with me on, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on wherever, send me an email and say, you know, why did you say that? And, and you know, have you ever thought about doing this? I'm, I think we can only serve the industry as good as we know what the industry needs. And this is where I'm I'm always happy for any kind of feedback. Well, that is a brilliant offer. Well, uh, what we will do is put all of um, Jakob's contact details. I might not give you his email address, but I'll put his LinkedIn. I'll put his LinkedIn address. In, it's out, in it's the... out there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all of his contact details will be in the show notes. You know where to find them. Um, take him up on that offer. Um, you'll have a great conversation if you do. Thanks, Jakob. Thank you, Kelly. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.